Hi guys, we are now going to begin discussing kind of a wide variety of viral families. Um, and before we get into that, I kind of want to lay some groundwork. Um, in this study packet, you're going to encounter five different families of viruses. I used to teach these all together in a two-hour lecture that was really helpfully entitled Other RNA Viruses. Yeah, it, it wasn't really all that useful. All that told you was that all of the viruses were RNA viruses. But what I like about how we're going about this now is that really um, the viruses we're going to talk about in this study packet are viruses that we associate with travel, um, partially because they aren't often seen in the United States, um, but really because they have very specific reservoirs, vectors, and therefore kind of life cycles for how they could potentially spread from person to person. So before we get into the different viral families, I kind of want to just lay some groundwork as to what these concepts mean and how you can apply understanding these concepts to your clinical understanding of these viruses and their transmission. Okay, so these are the five viruses I used to cover all at once. Um, the Flaviviridae, the Bunyaviridae, the Togaviridae, the Arenaviridae, and the Phyloviridae. Um, we, in this course, in your second course of med school, are going to cover some of these viruses, and then others we're going to cover later. And I actually have two tables um, at the end of this uh, video and in your self-study that actually lists out when we're going to cover each of these. So the Flaviviridae are... Um, definitely ones we're going to cover now. These would include things like West Nile virus um, and Zika and dengue and yellow fever, which are all things most people somewhere in their history have heard of. Um, St. Louis encephalitis virus you might not have heard of, but that's also a flavivirus. All of these are actually spread by an arthropod. They're spread by mosquitoes. And that's really important to their transmission cycle. And that's going to be kind of a trend that we're going to talk about in this video. Is something spread by a mosquito or is something rodent or other mammal born? Um, so when something's spread by a mosquito, an arthropod, we call it an arbovirus. There's no such uh, fun term for rodent born. But these viruses all have these specific um, cycles by how they're transmitted based on what uh, spreads them. So for the flavivirus, arthropods play a huge role in how they're spread. In the toga virus family, all of the alpha viruses, which is kind of like a subset of the toga virus family, are arboviruses. Um, the only one we're going to talk about in this course is chikungunya. We're going to cover the Venezuelan Western and Eastern equine encephalitis viruses in your brain behavior and cognition block. Um, the only toga virus that is not spread by an arbovirus is rubivirus, which causes rubella or German measles, which thankfully we don't see very much anymore now that there's a very good vaccination strategy. The bunya viruses, we've actually already talked about some. Um, specifically, I think we've talked about uh, Korean hemorrhagic fever and seen nombre, nombre virus, which causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. Um, these are not transmitted by arthropods. Instead, they're transmitted by coming in contact with dried rodent excrement and inhaling it. Um, so these are kind of a, a different mode of transmission, but you still need to have that risk factor of where you would have come in contact with this. However, these bunya viruses down here California encephalitis virus, lacrosse virus, which is actually named for a city in Wisconsin, and Jamestown Canyon virus all are spread by arthropods. So the bunya viruses are kind of a 50-50 split. Um, the arena viruses are also not arthropod-borne viruses. They're rodent-borne. Um, and we will talk about specifically the hemorrhagic fever viruses here, which would be Junin and Machupo and Lhasa. The other hemorrhagic fevers are not arboviruses either, thankfully. They are, again, these ones are actually spread kind of in a couple of ways. Um, they are certainly spread by contact with um, fruit bats and other animals. Um, and then they're also spread by kind of human cultural practices because they're spread uh, through tissue and through fluids. And those would include Marburg and Ebola, which I have a separate video on. Okay, so I keep saying arboviruses and arthropod viruses, which I guess at this point you guys have probably figured out it means a virus that's spread by an arthropod, but it's actually more than that. Um, it needs 
if a virus is an arbovirus, it has to have three things that it's able to do. First off, in a word, it has to be zoonotic. It has to be able to infect more than one species of animal because it has to be able to infect the arthropod and it also has to be able to infect us. So it has to be able to infect both vertebrates and invertebrates. In the vertebrate and the invertebrate, it's going to have kind of um, different things that it needs to accomplish. So first off, it needs to initiate viremia in the vertebrate, so in us. Why? Because otherwise it won't spread. Remember, the mosquito is going to take a blood meal from the host. Now, here's the tricky thing. It isn't that the mosquito, let's say I have an arbovirus, I'm infected with an arbovirus, and a mosquito is floating around in my office or flying around in my office and comes and bites me. It's not that when the mosquito then goes next door and bites somebody else that my blood is like given to them. That's not how it works. Instead, what happens is that the mosquito itself needs to become persistently and productively infected in its salivary gland. So what happens is the mosquito takes a blood meal from me, an infected person, the virus replicates within the mosquito, infecting the salivary gland, and that can take a week or two. Now, this mosquito is infectious, and when it goes next door and bites somebody else two weeks later, now it is biting it and infecting it at the same time with its own persistent infection. So it's not like a transfer of blood, it's actually a transfer of the virus. So the three things it needs to do is one, it needs to infect both us and the invertebrate. In the vertebrate, it has to have sufficient viremia so that we spread it to the mosquito. And then the mosquito needs to have a persistent salivary gland infection. So you can see right there then that that's kind of part of a life cycle, right? So man, we need viremia to spread to the salivary gland of a mosquito so that it can be spread back to man. So this winds up being part of a life cycle. Um, so there's actually very specific terms for how life cycles work and whether or not we're actually part of it or if we become a dead end host. And that is all based on there being sufficient viremia in us to infect the vector. All right, so each of the viruses we're going to discuss have different vectors and different reservoirs. A reservoir is kind of where the virus hangs out without causing significant disease. This is the viral source. It's the pool where it's able to live and actually be a good pathogen because it's not killing the host. Normally, the reservoir recovers and develops lasting immunity to the virus. Sometimes significant disease is produced in the reservoir, but not really, because think about it. If the virus kills the animal very quickly, then that doesn't become a lasting reservoir because theoretically at some point that virus would run out of host to infect as more and more hosts died. So the reservoir needs to be a, a pool of animals where the virus can replicate freely but doesn't kill the animal. Um, what's best in a reservoir for the virus is a prolonged period of viremia. This is what is required to maintain that arthropod-borne virus disease cycle. Vectors, on the other hand, are something very different. Um, vectors are what actually spread the virus. Um, so in the case of a lot of the viruses we're going to talk about, the vector is the mosquito. But ticks and sandflies and lice, those are all also arthropod vectors. Um, vectors typically don't have any symptoms, but they're able to transmit the virus very effectively um, from their salivary glands and their saliva during a bite. Um, and lots of the viruses that we're going to discuss today are more present in the tropics where the vector load is higher, right? We have more mosquitoes in the tropics than we do in, say, Alaska. Um, so there are kind of two models for how an arbovirus life cycle works, okay? Um, so they're called either a jungle cycle or a sylvatic cycle. 
um, or an urban cycle, okay? And it's actually pretty easy to tell apart. So in urban cycles, man is part of the life cycle, okay? So in this case, if the virus didn't infect us or didn't infect us in such a way that we got sufficient viremia, it would just go from biting monkey to insect, monkey to insect, monkey to insect. So in this case, the jungle or sylvatic cycle, the monkey acts as the reservoir and the insect acts as the vector. Now, if we become kind of an accidental host, let's say we go traipsing through the jungle and an insect bites us and we produce significant viremia, now another insect could bite us and transmit it to another man. And at that point, this section over here becomes the urban cycle. Now, let's take another option. There are viral um, infections that can be spread from insect to man, and then we do not create sufficient viremia. We don't have high viremia. So if we don't have high viremia, another insect biting us is not going to get infected. So at that point, we become a dead end host. So this is unlikely to cause some sort of major pandemic in man because we're just not going to create enough viremia to allow to create more flying vectors in our community. So this is called a, only a sylvatic or jungle cycle. So there are some viruses that only have a sylvatic or jungle cycle and some viruses that have both a sylvatic and an urban cycle. Okay. Um, so really good examples of this would be yellow fever and dengue fever. Yellow fever and dengue fever definitely fall down here because they have both a jungle cycle and an urban cycle. All right, this is a really important table. It's also in your notes. I can't stress this fact enough. I'm going to ask you this all the time. You have to, have to, have to know your vectors. You have to know your vectors. Vectors and reservoirs, I really want you to know. Now, the good thing is that the vectors are actually pretty simple, um, at least on this slide. Um, so you've got two main vectors, both mosquitoes, the Aedes aegyptus or Aedes albopticus, so Aedes species mosquitoes, and the Culex mosquito. Um, the Aedes aegyptus mosquito is typically seen kind of in um, warmer climates, okay? So we most often see it um, down south, uh, kind of in like, I don't know, Mississippi River Valley, and then in other parts, in the tropics and places like that. Um, the Aedes albopticus tends to come a little further north. So we'll see the Aedes albopticus in Iowa and Illinois and up into Vermont and New Hampshire. So that one actually has a further range. And what's kind of scary is that as we think about global warming, we're actually seeing more of both of these mosquitoes throughout the continental United States. And what that means is we have more potential vectors. We have more um, vectors available that could have productive salivary gland infections where we could see more of some of these viruses. Um, the Culex mosquito, this is kind of the one that's kind of all over the United States. So this one we're not getting away from. Um, but Aedes aegyptus actually used to be um, kind of reserved further south. But part of what we're seeing now is that we're seeing emerging infections as this Aedes um, genus of mosquitoes spreads. Um, and something I love to remind people of is yellow fever down here. Yellow fever virus once ran rampant. In Philadelphia there was a major epidemic of yellow fever virus so it's not that these diseases are never seen in the United States now granted that was the 1700s and we haven't had a major yellow fever outbreak in the United States in, you know over a hundred years but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen because we do have the vectors so with a more global economy with more travel and more exposure and with warming temperatures creating more opportunities for vector we are seeing higher incidence of some of these viruses in the continental u.s um, dengue and chikungunya and zika have all kind of come up huge in the last several years um, where we're actually seeing higher numbers of these viruses 
um, that are actually coming from natural infection, not just travel outside the United States anymore. Okay, the other group of um, viruses that I haven't really talked about very much are the animal reservoir viruses. So I've spent a lot of this video talking about mosquitoes, but there are also several important viruses that are not transmitted by an arthropod vector, but instead make their homes or reservoirs in rodents and other species of animals which we interact with. Um, these would include things like mice and rats, which certainly can get in our houses, but they can also include things like bats, mammals. Um, and in this case, the danger is actually interaction with the reservoir's tissue, fluids, or excrement, okay? Um, so let's start actually down at the bottom. So mice, rats, hamsters, all of these um, inhalation of dried uh, rodent urine can lead to a whole slew of bad things. In case you needed me to tell you to stay away from dried rodent urine, here's your warning. Um, so we've already talked about C. nombre virus. Um, but in this case, we're going to talk about um, Hantan and we're going to talk about Junin and Machupo. Um, we'll wait to talk about LCMV, which is lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus, till your brain and behavior and cognition block. But it's another one of these viruses that unfortunately people contract when they inhale um, rodent urine. Okay. Um, the rat can also spread its own fun. Um, Lassa virus is actually the cause of Lassa hemorrhagic fever, and we will talk about that in this case. Um, lastly, oh, I'm missing an A here. Um, and lastly, let's talk a little bit about Ebola and Marburg. Um, these are actually associated with interaction with animal meat. Um, or fluid and tissue. So if we're talking about like the animal reservoir, the fruit bat is the animal reservoir. And this is not some cute little bat that, you know, flies around eating gnats. Fruit bats are also known as mega bats. They are huge. They can be like five feet at their wingtips and they're terror. This is the stuff of nightmares. And then they also, on top of that, can give you a nightmare severe, highly fatal hemorrhagic virus. So moral of the story, stay away from fruit bats and their tissues, but also stay away from their blood and um, any sort of uh, fluid, um, because that's the other way Ebola and Marburg are spread. And that's actually typically how humans spread it to each other is interaction with their tissues and fluids. So we'll talk about that one in this case as well. Just like I said, you had to know your vectors, you have to know your reservoirs, because if you know your reservoirs, you know the patient risk factor for how they might have contracted this virus. So in addition to the reservoirs and vectors and the RNA uh, genome structure that they might share, um, all of these viruses are going to cause kind of the same collection of syndromes. Um, the first is uh, the undifferentiated fever. Um, you've encountered this before. Undifferentiated fever is what patients experience pretty much any time they are exposed to a viral infection. Um, this is also known as the very ominous sounding fever of unknown origin. Um, really what this is, is it's a bad viral infection. Um, you get high fevers, 102 to 105. So it is kind of kicked up a notch. Um, headaches, myalgia, arthralgia, malaise. Um, the symptoms normally last about three to 10 days. And for many patients, depending on the virus, certainly not with Ebola and Marburg, but for many patients, um, it's gonna resolve without sequelae. Um, the symptoms are so nonspecific, it is unlikely that we'll ever know what the etiologic agent is, unless some sort of specific testing was done. Um, good examples of ones that would kind of follow this pathway are like Zika. Zika just kind of causes this undifferentiated fever. And aside from pregnant women and a few unlucky people who develop Guillain-Barre, um, it, it just kind of, you have a viral syndrome and then it goes away. Um, then the kind of the next level is what we call hemorrhagic fever. So you still get all of the symptoms of undifferentiated fever. You're still going to have those high fevers, headaches, myalgia, arthralgia, malaise, things like that. But now you're going to have profuse bleeding and the bleeding is going to be everywhere. It's going to be in the skin, um, in the gums. You can have severe GI pain and that's actually due to hemorrhaging within the gastrointestinal tract. 
um, cramping. Um, and the, the cramping and um, pain is actually also associated with thrombocytopenia. So you're having like poor clotting that's happening. Um, this is what's actually going to lead to shock. And this is pretty much what's fatal. This is what actually causes patients to die. Um, one thing I will point out here, and we'll go into this a lot more in the future, it is really, really important that if you suspect your patient has a hemorrhagic fever, that you not treat them with NSAIDs. They actually kind of block the entire clotting pathway. So you're actually perpetuating the problem if you have a patient who has hemorrhagic fever that you put on NSAIDs for pain. Okay, and the last one that we often see is encephalitis. So this would be the case with like West Nile virus or St. Louis encephalitis virus. Um, basically, once again, you're still going to get all the symptoms associated with undifferentiated fever because that's just a viral infection. But now we're going to add on that that headache is going to be really severe. The patient might have a very stiff neck or difficulty moving their neck. Um, they can have altered mental status, which is kind of a... Um, I, I know neurologists hate that term, like what does altered mental status mean? Um, but, you know, changes in behavior, hallucinations, things like that, um, change in their mental state. Um, and you can also see seizures. Um, and then even when the virus kind of concludes, often patients are left with some significant neurologic sequelae. Um, and there is significant mortality associated with some of these encephalitis viruses. So those are kind of the syndromes that we expect to see with some of the viruses that we're going to talk about in this self-study. Okay, so how do you diagnose them? Um, diagnosing them is actually probably the most straightforward. Um, for the most part, you're going to do PCR. It's a virus. So you're going to detect the viral genome, and then you're going to know what you're dealing with. Um, you can typically do that in blood or urine. For some of them, you can even use other tissues. Like, for instance, for Ebola, um, one of the things we found is that it actually hangs out in the semen a lot longer than sometimes we can detect it in other tissues. Um, same can be said for Zika. Um, so that, that's kind of how we're going to detect it. You can also use serology. Um, but remember, serology can be kind of tricky, right? Because once a patient has had it, they're going to have a positive serology for a long period of time. So you might need to follow, vector, uh, follow titer if that's how you're using to diagnose. So how do we prevent it? Um, for those that I kind of listed a reservoir, you avoid the reservoir. So if you want to avoid Ebola, avoid bushmeat and people who have Ebola. Um, for those that are arboviruses, you avoid the vector. So wear long sleeves, use mosquito netting, use insect repellent. Um, there are some immunizations for some of the viruses that are arboviruses. Um, most notably, yellow fever does have a vaccine that is used in kind of high endemic areas. Um, I know they're in the process um, and may have recently approved a dengue vaccine. Um, that's kind of been coming down the pipeline for a couple of years now. So when there's immunization, certainly those are an option as well.